everyone, this is Dr. Mondel. Welcome to English 314, Module 6, Lecture 4, Guided Analysis of Helen Benedict Sandqueen with Contextual Information. Things that you'll need for this lecture from Blackboard in Module 6, you might find it helpful to have the discussion board number 9, Threads Activity on Helen Benedict Sandqueen Instructions pulled up. In the last lecture, I, I also talked about keeping running notes for discussion board number 9, in which you kept track of threads and passages of interest as you were reading Sand Queen. So having those things available might be useful as we do the guided close readings and kind of discussion of some of the passages there in case it sparks any ideas for you. Elsewhere online we've got four links for today. There's a blog called Baghdad Burning. Um, so I've given you two uh, websites for that. You've got the main link to the blog and then you've also got another link on which appear uh, some posts that I'll, that I'll be referring to specifically which I'll be quoting on the slides. And then we're also going to be talking about um, some of the Iraqi prisoner abuse that actually happened uh, during the Iraq War. And there are three particular websites I've linked here. So there's a timeline of prison abuses. The source there is CNN. You also have another timeline of prison abuses provided by the Washington Post. Um, so you've got kind of two kinds of sources there. And then you have, um, and just as a warning, these are graphic and disturbing photos, uh, but you can see the distinct uh, similarity between what actually happened uh, in fact in Iraq and some of the things that are depicted in Sand Queen. Um, these are torture photos of the actual uh, abuse that took place uh, at an Iraqi prison by U.S. soldiers. U.S. soldiers were the inflictors of this abuse and those are provided by the Guardian or archived by the Guardian. And other materials we will be using Sand Queen pretty heavily during this lecture. I know that typically during lectures I tend to put passages that I'm talking about on the slide, um, but I haven't actually done that for this lecture. So you'll definitely want your book uh, to be able to follow along with some of the passages that I'll be talking about. And if you need to pause this lecture for just a minute and grab your book, uh, please do so. So for today's agenda, we're going to talk about some of the historical context for the novel. One is a blog kept by an Iraqi woman called Baghdad Burning. We're also going to talk about uh, the Iraqi prisoner abuse that actually took place during the Iraq War. And then I will guide you through some close reading and discussion of various passages in San Queen. So first, I want to tell you a little bit about Baghdad Burning. So you know that this is a website, and you can actually go to this site. It's still available, riverbendblog.blogspot.com. So an Iraqi woman who actually experienced the Iraq War in 2003, um, she actually kept a blog titled Baghdad Burning during this time. Uh, this was widely read and discussed. Uh, during that time and, and since then certainly people have referred to it. It's become a major uh, text in terms of a discussion of how everyday Iraqis sort of on the ground experienced uh, the war, the uh, U.S. Uh, led uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq and some of the uh, violent changes uh, in Iraqi society that happened with all of those activities. Um, and I want to draw your attention to a few specific uh, excerpts from this blog that resonate quite closely with the novel. Um, and Helen Benedict has mentioned this particular uh, blog as well when she came to Ashland University uh, in the spring earlier this year and talked with students and faculty and, and also gave a reading. Um, she did mention that you know this was something that also influenced some of her uh, depictions of what was happening. So from Friday, September 19th, 2003, um, you can scroll down to that entry on the blog if you like. I've excerpted here. Um, so the writer of this blog, who main maintains uh, a non or remains anonymous, maintains a pseudonym, um, she writes the following. Quote, everyone is worried about raids lately. We hear about them from friends and relatives. We watch them on TV, outraged, and try to guess where the next set of raids are going to occur. Anything can happen. Some raids are no more than seemingly standard weapons checks. Three or four troops knock on the door and march in. One of them keeps an eye on the, quote, family while the rest take a look around the house. They check bedrooms, kitchens, bathrooms, and gardens. They look under beds, behind curtains, inside closets, and cupboards. All you have to do is stifle your feelings of humiliation, anger, and resentment at having foreign troops from an occupying army search your home. Some raids are, quite simply, raids. 
the door is broken down in the middle of the night, troops swarm in by the dozens, families are marched outside, hands behind their backs, and bags upon their heads. Fathers and sons are pushed down onto the ground, a booted foot on their head or back. Other raids go horribly wrong. We constantly hear about families who are raided in the small hours of the morning. The father or son picks up a weapon, thinking they are being attacked by looters, and all hell breaks loose. Family members are shot, others are detained, and often women and children are left behind wailing. So this is a description from an Iraqi civilian who was living in Baghdad uh, during the war. And she's describing here some of the raids that took place that were widely known amongst Iraqi families that, that this could happen. And you can see here um, the stark uh, similarities between what happens in Naima's own family, the way that she describes how the soldiers burst into her house, how her father and her younger brother Zaki are taken away and put in the prison. Um, and you can see uh, a lot of overlap here in the way that this is being described. So this is a pretty, a pretty realistic uh, depiction of what was happening uh, to Iraqis during this period. The author of this blog also addresses gender quite a bit uh, throughout the blog if you read various posts. And this is quite significant for our class not only because it addresses gender issues more broadly and because it talks about some of the things that you actually see Naima discussing in the book, um, but also towards the beginning of the semester um, there was a discussion post in which uh, somebody actually mentioned Iraq in particular as an example of a patriarchal society uh, in which women uh, basically were denied sort of basic rights. Um, and I had commented on that, on that post and mentioned that while well, certainly, you know, like, like many societies, uh, Iraq uh, poses challenges for, for women, particularly with the rise of what used to be fringe elements uh, in, in the society, Iraq actually has quite a vibrant history of women in, say, the medical professions, in law, in universities, uh, etc., and had been known for this, actually, although due to Orientalism, perhaps not in the Western world. Um, and the blog contains some very interesting statements about this, and I thought for our own edification, our own uh, education, and to kind of get a view that is not Orientalist, uh, we can rely on somebody who was born and raised in Iraq, uh, who herself uh, you know, studied in Iraq, uh, to, to get a sense of this. So this is from Tuesday, September 16th, 2003. And the writer is responding to comments made about women in Iraq by a woman named Shatha Jafar in a TV program, so that's the occasion for her writing this blog post. And the author of Baghdad Burning writes the following. Quote, Shatha was full of self-righteous blabbering. She instantly lost any point she was trying to make by claiming that girls in Iraq were largely ignorant and illiterate due to the last 30 years. She said that Iraqis began pulling their daughters out of school because non-Baathists weren't allowed an education. And the Baath party, she's talking about some of the um, political and ideological uh, uh, parties in Iraq during this period, and she's basically referencing um, what this person, Shatha Jafar, has said about people who don't belong to uh, particular kind of political groups being denied an education. So in response to that, uh, the author of Baghdad Burning writes, Strangely enough, I wasn't a Baathist, and I got accepted into one of the best colleges in the country based solely on my grades in my final year of high school. None of my friends were Baathists, and they ended up pharmacists, doctors, dentists, translators, and lawyers. I must have been living somewhere else. Every time Shatha was on screen, I threw used tissues at her. She feeds into the usual pre-war slash post-occupation propaganda that if you weren't a Baathist, you weren't allowed to learn. After 35 years, that would mean that the only illiterate, sophisticated, and educated people in Iraq are Baathists. Something you probably don't know about Iraq. We have 18 public universities and over 10 private universities, plus 28 technical schools and workshops. The difference between private and public colleges is that the public colleges and universities like Baghdad University are free without tuition. The private colleges ask for a yearly tuition, which is a pittance compared to colleges abroad. Public colleges are preferred because they are considered more educationally sound.
Arab students come from all over the region to study in our colleges and universities because they are the best. So here you have a sense of um, a couple of things. You have a sense of her trying to correct a misperception that Baathists are privileged in educational opportunities. And she's saying that's actually not true. If that were true, the only people in these occupations would be Baathists, and that's not true. But she's also talking about uh, the rich educational opportunities that are available, uh, the fact that Iraq is sort of renowned or was renowned at this time uh, before the occupation um, in the region for this. And she continues to talk specifically about gender and to address some of the claims that were being made on this TV program about women. Well, sorry, excuse me, women. So I'm going to switch to that on the next slide. So this is continued. The author of Baghdad Burning in the same post writes, Anyway, according to the student's average and the averages of the people applying to other colleges, the student is placed. You don't even meet the dean or department head until after classes have begun. Ironically, the illiterate females Shatha mentions have higher averages than the males. A guy can get into an engineering college with a 92%, while for females, the average is around 96% because the competition between females is so high. So here she's trying to talk about how women actually outperform men uh, educationally, such that, for example, in engineering college, um, it's actually the, the bar is higher for women because you have so many highly qualified women who are already there. Um, so she's kind of explaining how some of these stereotypes about illiterate women not being able to have an education, uh, etc., are patently false. Um, she goes on to say in response to Shatha Jafar, what Shatha doesn't mention is that in engineering, science, and medical colleges, over half of the students in various departments are females, literate females, by the way. Our male and female graduates are some of the best in the region and many public universities arrange for scholarships and fellowships in Europe and America. But Shatha wouldn't know that, or I must be wrong, either way, excuse me please, I am after all illiterate and unlearned. So you hear, you see here, this is a personal response, right? She's writing on a blog, she's not writing an academic paper. Um, so her response, she is taking this quite personally. She's talking about how she's watching a television program. She's using humor in this entry by talking about how she happened to have the flu at the time and was throwing used, <laughs> used tissues at the television uh, when she heard things that were upsetting because they, they according to her, um, really don't stand up against some of the statistics and some of the information about how life was actually on the ground. And I think that, you know, particularly for those of us living in the West, those of us based in the U.S. who have very limited exposure, uh, perhaps only through the news or only through certain kinds of literature uh, to Iraq, it might be easy uh, to have certain perceptions of the society, to have certain perceptions of women. And make no mistake, women in Iraq, just like women everywhere else, deal with patriarchy. I mean, that is clear. And we have heard a lot of stories about extremism. We have heard a lot of stories about the continually escalating and worsening violence in Iraq that has happened, particularly since 2003, with the rise of various, uh, you know, groups, extremist groups that were not there at the time. Nevertheless, when we're talking about things like, quote, Iraqi culture, or, quote, Iraqi society, um, it's very important to be accurate, right? And, and this is one of those cases, just like when we were talking about passing and other works of literature, I want to clarify, I'm not saying that people can't have diverse opinions. It's very important, especially at a university, um, to encourage a vibrant and diverse range of opinions, to have discussions about other cultures. What I'm saying is that at a university in particular, it's, it's really, really important for us to be accurate, right? For us to have um, the same basic information we're dealing with about what's actually going on. And in fact, before the war, uh, you had a situation that was not, you know, completely backwards and women can't speak and women don't go to school and they aren't in the professions and they're never seen, they're never heard, they have to obey men all the time. These things are not actually true. Um, I'm not saying they're never true, but as overwhelming kind of stereotypes or as orientalist uh, stereotypes, they are untrue. And part of the reason why I'm really 
emphasizing this is this is crucial for us to understand Sand Queen, right? Because we have an Iraqi woman who's a medical student, um, who is clearly somebody who has, you know, definitely a lot of a lot of backbone and a lot of strength to be walking four kilometers each way every single day to go to the prison and find out what's happened to her to her uh, father and brother, um, and all the other kinds of things that she does. And the idea here is she's not the exception. It's not as if Naima is super Iraqi woman and all other Iraqi women are, you know, just covered up and never speak and never think and never do anything else. She is one of a horde of women. I mean, so many who are doing this every single day. Um, so it's important to think about uh, the society and the culture from which Naima emerges in a way that is accurate and in a way that allows her to understand her character fully. Another piece of context here, this is from Tuesday, September 16th, 2003. So we've talked about this issue where uh, the writer of Baghdad Burning is, is kind of responding back to some of the Orientalist stereotypes about Iraqi women, but she's also talking about how things have changed since the Iraq War started. And this is something that Helen Benedict also talks about. We get a lot of this from Naima. So the author of this blog says the following. The story of police in Baghdad was a farce. They weren't nearly enough, and the Americans were doing nothing about the security of the people. And you really get this through Kate and Naima. Both of them say that there's not enough being done. Right? There, there are a lot of problems here in terms of the society not properly being regulated. Ever since it's invaded and it's taken over, there are clearly other concerns that are preoccupying uh, the Americans in the work that they are doing. And so you have a lot of dangers in terms of kind of the, the everyday society that the police is, is not handling either. So in regard, with regard to this issue, uh, the author of Baghdad Burning continues, quote, more and more females are being made to quit work or school or college. I spent last month trying to talk a neighbor's mother into letting her 19-year-old daughter take her retests in a leading pharmaceutical college. Her mother was adamant and demanded to know what she was supposed to do with her daughter's college degree if anything happened to her daughter. Quote, hang it on her tombstone with the consolation that my daughter died for a pharmaceutical degree? She can sit this year out. And so here you're seeing how in a society in which women had many opportunities, and in fact, they didn't just have those opportunities, they were taking them and were exceeding, in some cases, the bar. If you looked at, you know, gender, and looked at kind of the performance of men and women, you have some serious problems after the war starts because it becomes simply dangerous uh, for women to continue, uh, for example, to go to school, really to, to sort of be out uh, as they used to be. And this was for a variety of reasons. There's a crime issue where the society is no longer being uh, supervised. You have all these other elements that are coming in. Um, so it becomes much more dangerous. And so there is certainly an effect on women. And we talked in a previous lecture about the transnational feminist critique of militarism. We talked about how typically war, not just the actual sort of violence that happens, but the aftermath, everything that happens as a result, disproportionately affects women. And you can definitely see that in the shift in Iraqi women being able to get an education. Helen Benedict talks specifically about some of these issues. If you flip to page 311 of Sand Queen at the very end, there is an author's note, and she writes this in 2010. She mentions that she wrote this seven years later. Um, and she gives a little bit of perspective of what's happening in 2010. So this is, this is before uh, when we're reading this now, but after the novel had been, uh, after the setting of the novel. So Benedict writes, quote, everyday conditions for Iraqis are not much better than they were in the time Naima describes. The United Nations reports that hundreds of thousands of Iraqi civilians have been killed. Two million have fled the country, and two million more have been internally displaced. The water and sewage systems, electricity and hospitals continue to be barely operational and much worse than they were before the war. Daily violence continues and corruption is rife, while disease and birth defects are on the rise from depleted uranium and other pollutants of war. 
the 1959 Family Code that protected Iraqi women anywhere in the Middle East outside of Turkey has been dismantled, pushing back women's rights 50 years. And we'll talk in just a little bit about some passages from the novel that specifically reference the way in which the war specifically changes Naima's experience uh, as, as a woman living in Iraq, uh, particularly with regard to things like having to wear the hijab and you know some of those issues uh, that were not issues for her before. Um, but I, I want to draw your attention to how deeply uh, kind of connected to the actual context San Queen is. And part of this is because Benedict is a journalist, right? That is that is her training. So even though she's writing this work of fiction, um, she is somebody who is representing things as they were uh, with with realism. So now I'm going to go into our next piece of context, which is Iraqi prisoner abuse. This is very, very difficult, so I just want you to to know that going into this, that what I'm going to what I'm going to be talking about um, is hard to talk about. It's hard to think about. Um, so the Iraq War was premised on the presence of WMDs or weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So there was this this notion that that is why the United States entered this military conflict, because Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction, which were then not found. And so you know you you may be familiar with that whole debate where there was enormous. Um, resistance amongst people in the United States to enter this conflict because there were people in the United States who did not believe that there were these WMDs who had seen no evidence of it um, and in fact you know it, it was found that that there wasn't any and so this became a huge um, kind of problem in terms of uh, American support or not support for the war and as you continue to hear even now um, the idea of troops in Iraq, troops not in Iraq uh, from the United States has been a source of enormous controversy uh, politically and otherwise. And as you know from watching The Invisible War, that has directly affected the lives of thousands and thousands of people, ranging from things like PTSD, things like people who thought they were on their last deployment and then they weren't, um, and, and the effect on their families, on their children, uh, etc., as well as the sexual assault and the rape uh, that occurred. And I want to really emphasize here that while we've been foci focusing a lot, particularly in the previous lectures on sexual assault and rape against American women and you know some of the problems there, um, these issues were not limited to American women. And in fact, you had prisoner abuse, which really brought this to the forefront in terms of Americans who were violating Iraqis. Uh, and that is what we are about to talk about. And it is it is morally reprehensible when anybody is sexually assaulted or tortured or abused. Um, the fact that there's photographic evidence of this happening to Iraqis um, makes this a little bit different for us to engage. Because, uh, you know, we weren't watching videos of, of a rape earlier, for example. We weren't seeing photographs of it. We were seeing very difficult uh, images of survivors talking about what had happened uh, through invisible war. This is this is a little bit different. This is a kind of another level. I just want to prepare you for that so that we can uh, intellectually engage this material uh, with with that preparation. So there was serious abuse of Iraqi detainees by U.S. soldiers, including at the Abu Ghraib prison, which is actually mentioned in San Queen. It's mentioned a few times. I have uh, given you page 117 as one particular place in which Abu Ghraib is described as a prison previously used by Saddam Hussein uh, and then was, was operated by uh, the United States. So this serious abuse of Iraqi de detainees by U.S. soldiers was captured in some photographs. Somebody found these photographs and reported them. And as a result, um, people around the world really became aware of what was happening. Um, according to the CNN link, you have a timeline of prison abuses. So you have the various names of soldiers who were involved. You have some of the cases that happened. You have a description uh, of some of the things that happened. Uh, you have the timeline of prison abuses in the Washington Post link, and then the actual photographs, which, again, warning, these are graphic and disturbing. So I'm going to summarize just a few things that you can find in these sources, and you can peruse these links on your own. Um, but basically, we need to remember a couple of things to, to kind of help make sense of this. One is remember that the kind of people, the kinds of people who were imprisoned in Abu Ghraib, 
went all across the board. Some of these people were, for example, known criminals and, and had done something uh, illegal or something damaging or dangerous uh, to be imprisoned. But some people who were imprisoned in Abu Ghraib were like Naima's father and brother. All right, so you had, you know, you had a lot of different kinds of people. You didn't necessarily have everybody there um, having been charged with something, having been having gone through any kind of judicial process to be convicted. This isn't when I say prison. That's not the kind of prison we're talking about, right? This isn't the same sort of um, system that that we might be familiar with in the United States, and so. The kind of people who were tortured, the kind of people who were abused, the kind of people who, some of whom were raped, um, humiliated, uh, and, and photographed in this position, um, some of these people, if, if you can imagine, were like Naima's father. Okay, so, so that's important here. In terms of what actually happened, you had a range of different types of abuse, so you did actually have uh, rapes in a few cases. You also had prisoners who were uh, forced to masturbate and um, photographed doing that. You had prisoners who were forced to put, for example, women's underwear on their head and be photographed doing that, uh, who were naked and forced to simulate, uh, to simulate sexual activity. Um, people who were uh, naked and forced to get into a pile and then jumped on people who were uh, put in a room and then unmuzzled dogs, so sort of dogs, very aggressive dogs without muzzles, were, were put into the room with them, um, I think in at least one case resulting in a bite and severe injury. There were photographs of dead Iraqis that were taken um, and, you know, their, with their faces shown and their injuries shown. Uh, and, and as I said before, not all of these people uh, were there after having engaged in any kind of criminal uh, behavior. So you also had uh, an infamous photo of a man who's standing, he's hooded so you can't see his face, his arms are out, he's forced to stand on top of a box and there are wires attached to him. You had prisoners with wires attached to their genitalia, their fingers, uh, their toes, etc. Um, so this is the kind of uh, treatment that we're talking about. And when we think about who these people were, when you think about, for example, somebody like Naima's father, who had already been tortured under Saddam Hussein's, Saddam Hussein's regime, um, and the kind of gentleness that he had, and, and you know the kind of person that he was, I mean, we as readers read his love letters, because Naima's mother tells Naima to read them. Um, it, it humanizes the people in those photographs, um, when those photographs really dehumanize them and when their everyday experience also dehumanizes them. So this is important context uh, to keep in mind in terms of the detainees and uh, you know why they may behave the way they do, how they are being treated. Um, Kate talks about how you know they're, they're being kept there and being treated better than the soldiers. We know the soldiers are not living in very good conditions right at Camp Bucca. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind uh, the, the treatment of the detainees as well. Lindy England is one name that emerged during this period uh, in, the, in the few years around these uh, incidents who was particularly notorious for the photos with detainees. You can see I think at least a couple of them uh, on the Guardian website where she's got, for example, an Iraqi man lying on the ground and she's got a leash around his neck, a dog leash. Um, a, a few other photos where she's pr she's pretending to have a gun aimed towards um, the genitalia of, of a man who's an Iraqi man who's standing there naked, etc. So she became particularly uh, notorious and discussed during this time uh, because of her actions. And when you think about people like Lindy England or some of the other women involved, we might think about Kate. Kate, of course, as we talked about from her earlier discussion with Naima outside the checkpoint, is interesting because she's not somebody who is completely 100% dominated by, you know, Orientalist sort of violent views, and she can't get out of that. She actually does have a conversation with Naima. She does actually get to know her a little bit. She does keep trying to find Naima's family, which we see throughout the text. And in fact, we will talk about that really difficult to talk about scene where she is abusing a detainee and she thinks she's getting revenge on 
the man that has been pestering her and harassing her and throwing things at her while she's been in the tower and she realizes that the person that she uh, is is abusing is Naima's father uh, the very person she's been looking for the one one of the two Iraqi men that has actually been humanized for her um, and so this this context of abuse that we're looking at in which the Iraqi men just seem to be bodies piled up right they're completely dehumanized in these photos you see the soldiers treating them like they're less than animals I mean less than even the dogs that are that are released onto them that's kind of the way that Kate is perceiving Naima's father right before she knows that that's Naima's father that's she sees this as just one of those bodies just one of those enemies um, and you can see the effect of that when you look at some of these torture photos and consider uh, some of these cases of abuse. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, particular parts of Sand Queen that I think might be of interest to you as you are thinking about your last paper, which is a short paper. It's a three to four page paper where you're analyzing through close reading a few passages and developing a larger argument about them. Um, and even though it's a short paper, uh, it might seem difficult to develop because there's so much to talk about with this book. So hopefully this will provide you with a little bit of guidance. Uh, the first passage starts on page 96 and continues on to page 97. So if you have your book, I'd like you to go ahead and turn to that page. And here there's a discussion of Kate's family. Uh, and specifically, she happens to be on her watchtower at this point. Um, and she, she kind of describes... <coughs> excuse me, she kind of describes uh, her post. So on 96, she says in the next to last paragraph, this is what I have with me for the job, my rifle, two MREs, three one liter bottles of water, a pack of cigarettes, a walkie talkie that crackles but doesn't work, a radio that doesn't work either, a chair and a headache. I play with the walkie talkie a while to see if I can get it to do something, but it really is a piece of crap. It looks exactly like the toy one Tyler gave April for her seventh birthday except that one worked better than this. We let her bring it once when she was camping with us and we had a lot of fun hiding in the woods where we wouldn't see each other and being able to talk anyhow. When she lost hers and cried, because in our family that would have got her spanked, Tyler crouched down beside her and said, hey there, everybody loses things sometimes, I'll get you another. So no April showers, okay? I hate that joke, April said between sobs, but she was smiling a little too. Tyler's often like that, his whole family is. His mom and dad take things easy, like he did with the lost walkie-talkie, even though they've got five kids and not much money. They could hardly be more different from my parents. Dad runs us like we're part of his sheriff's department. Rules here, rules there, not just about saying grace before we talk and locking the gun in the sideboard, but all day long. He even puts lists of our daily schedules up on the fridge. I think he'd make April and me call him sir if mom let him. He likes posting mottos around the house, too. Take responsibility for your actions. Don't blame others for your mistakes. If you dig your own grave, you must lie in it. Guess that's what I've done. Dug my own grave. And then she goes on and talks about uh, the prisoners. So you can see here uh, a few things that might be significant in terms of analyzing, if you're interested in this. Um, the novel kind of going back and forth sometimes when Kate is in Iraq between uh, the actual setting that Kate's in, the description of what she's got with her, the objects that are there, uh, and then what's happening back home or memories of back home. And in particular, you have a, quite a contrast in terms of masculinity between Tyler and the way that Tyler handles, say, the lost walkie-talkie and the way that Kate's family is run, and in particular, the way that her father uh, kind of maintains a sense of control over the family. Particularly the locking of the gun in the sideboard. We talked about the gun being a phallic symbol uh, and the way that Kate now has her rifle uh, and her own objects. You can really see that by serving uh, in, in this situation, serving in the war, um, she has appropriated the power of the phallus and being able to you know, play this role of, of a soldier. Um, and it seems like her father's attempts to exert patriarchal control have been really internalized by Kate such that 
you know, she's actually turning it on herself and saying, guess that's what I've done, dug my own grave, even though she, of course, was not responsible for her own sexual assault, and she is not responsible for um, some of the harassment that she's enduring. So it might be interesting to look at that, the contrast between sort of Iraq and home, the different models of masculinity that are available to Kate, the one that she sort of chooses to emulate, which is her father, uh, and, and kind of what happens when she chooses to emulate a violent, aggressive, and militaristic masculinity as opposed to what she sees in Tyler. The graffiti uh, that appears in the novel is also significant. This is on page 104. And if you look on page 104, um, this is after Kate is uh, assaulted, and they see on the Porta Johns uh, some things written there, um, and you can see them all in caps on page 104. Uh, I'm not going to read these, but I am going to uh, analyze a little bit. So you see um, all in caps the slur uh, about Kate that's put up there, and then the novel reads under it are 14 names, and then she has some of the names close to half the guys in her tent. Uh, at least DJ's name isn't there, nor is Cormick's. Doesn't want to draw attention to himself, I guess, but Jimmy's is. Um, and then Third Eye comes up and says, all I can say is I warned you. And remember, Third Eye is the one who says that to get respect, um, she either has to be mean or sleep around. So in terms of the graffiti, um, there are th a few things that are of concern here. First of all, you can see that the fact that the actual names of the men are written here, um, more than half the men in her tent, there, there's a culture here that indicates that people would be familiar uh, with um, and comfortable with this this culture where they're not going to get in trouble for this, right? It's it's Kate um, who's going to experience discomfort for this. If you have a workplace environment or a professional environment in which sexual harassment, rape culture, like we talked about in the previous lecture, are not tolerated you're not going to have graffiti like this, you know, popping up and people's names on it, right? So you can definitely see that the culture and the environment is such that people feel like this is this is permissible for them to do in this environment and they can they can actually have people's names there. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the kinds of wording, the kind of wording that's used in the in the all caps letters and the graffiti. Um, so first of all, uh, Kate is is basically objectified, sexually objectified, and we talked about this in the previous lecture. Um, so she's not referred to by rank, and just her name isn't there, um, but actually a body part that is sexualized before Brady. And then you have this idea um, uh, in, the, in the quotation that she, you know, she's depicted as uh, performing this sexual act, and that sexual act, the description of that, um, is actually very important. We've been talking a lot about the phallus, and this idea of the phallus being a symbolic representation of the penis and thus male power. So we talked a lot about the rifle, right, and, and the idea that the rifle is a phallic symbol in this novel. Here you literally have the penis being represented. You have male power um, through, you know, sexuality being represented here, but Kate is, is portrayed here in a passive role, right? Once again, this notion of a woman being violated, being penetrated by this powerful uh, male organ is what's being represented here. Um, and in some sense, there's this, this way in which she's sort of being assaulted all over again, uh, just by the terminology here. And then the, you know, sign here, if you've, you know, uh, been with her type of thing, um, is some of that, we talked about rape culture, and we talked specifically about the term slut-shaming, the idea that when there is some sort of sexual event, you know, men are high-fived, women are shamed. This sexual event was not one in which Kate was a willing participant at all. She is assaulted while she's on the job. Um, nevertheless, there's this sense that there are 14 names, 14, you know, um, people sort of high-fived, even though this is, we know that this isn't true, they haven't all been with her, uh, and Kate is the one who is shamed. So you see an explicit example of rape culture here. If this is something that you're tracking throughout the novel, I've talked to, I think, two people so far who are really uh, enraged by and interested in this, uh, this passage is one that I think has, has a lot uh, to look at. I think something that was particularly painful for both of the people that I talked to uh, so far about, about this rape culture in this novel is the response of Kate's parents. And we actually spent a lot of time talking about this. So on the bottom of 104, um, 
you know, Kate's parents call her. Um, they're having this conversation. It's difficult for them to even talk. They're in the United States. She's in Iraq. So she talks about the cell phone crackling. This is on 104. And then her, her mother calls. And her mother says, It's so good to hear your voice, sweetie. You know you can call any hour you want. You okay? Not hurt or anything? No, no, I'm fine. But mom... My voice is trembling. I can hear it echoing in a pathetic whine. Mom, mom... It isn't going so good out here. I'm going to pause right right here for just a second. Um, the fact that she's hearing her mom echoing and she describes it as a pathetic whine, as if her admitting that this is this is happening is whining somehow or being weak somehow, you can see some of the internalized uh, sexism, the internalized oppression uh, that Kate has absorbed the fact that she's already kind of victim blaming when she's about to tell her mother something but hasn't even said it yet so you can see the layers of that going on and then her mom there's this delay right in what she can hear so she says thank the lord no did you hear me i don't know if i can hack it what oh yes i can hear you now i'm sorry you feel that way that way honey but don't give up you're just adjusting i'm sure it'll get easier and if you just pray to the lord jesus he will help you he'll help you be strong I am being strong. That's not what I... Katie, Dad's on the other extension, but I can hardly hear his voice between the echoes of mine and Mom's. Don't worry, little girl. Just hang in there. Everyone has a rough time in the Army sometimes. It was hard for me, too, when I first entered the force, but I know you can do it. We have faith in you, sweetheart. But be brave, my girl. Remember, we love you. God loves you. Make us proud. Um, you might notice already, just looking at the page those dashes those dashes are are heartbreaking to see um because you know that you, we know what's unsaid and they don't right the parents don't so as as a tool as a kind of literary tool here those unfinished sentences are profound um because they tell us that what isn't heard uh is something that Kate you know keeps keeps inside of her and is forced to um, deal with and, and her own parents not even to know about that. Her father's response and her mother's response are also telling. So you have this reference to uh, praying to the Lord Jesus, helping you be strong, etc. Um, and then her dad saying, you know, I had a hard time too, basically. And we know from watching The Invisible War and reading up to page 105 <laughs> at, at this point that Kate's father's experience in the military is, n is nothing like Kate's experience in the military. He was not in a professional environment in which it would have been permissible for him to be sexually assaulted and for this to have happened in the way that it has happened to Kate. Um, and furthermore, um, some of the ter terms that are being used, so something like, don't worry little girl, just hang in there. Um, he, she is literally his little girl, but there's this sense that um, he's not seeing her as, as someone who's become involved in this very adult uh, situation in which she's been violated. There's also this line of um, kind of Christianity that goes through this novel, the entire novel, in terms of the kind of um, Christian God that her parents embrace and um, the way that Kate's life actually unfolds. And there's quite a disconnect between the narrative of Jesus that her parents espouse um, and the version of Christ that Kate first kind of thinks she's following when she joins the war. Remember there's that conversation she has with the family priest, uh, Father Slattery I believe his name is, where um, the priest tells her that, you know, always remember about how Jesus lifted up the downtrodden, etc. And Kate thinks to herself, yes, that's what I'll be doing when I go to war. Um, and that's very different from her parents' version of, of Jesus and kind of what's going on there. So there's these conflicting narratives, uh, religious narratives, and you also have those dashes uh, that are illustrations of Kate's voice being unheard. And you have a lot of those illustrations throughout the text. Um, moving a little bit forward on 113, we switch to Naima's narrative. And I had referred to this a couple of times already, um, but I think it's important to actually look at this part of the text where Naima is talking about the hijab. Um, so I'm on the last full paragraph on page 113. She's been thinking about her father. Um, and actually, the second to last paragraph on 113, she's describing what her father already went through. Um, when she, when he was uh, imprisoned by Saddam Hussein. And she's actually talked in the paragraph above that about Zaki and how he's completely unprotected because he's being held with people, some of whom are innocent, but some of whom are 
as, as Naima says, thugs and thieves. Quote, because everyone knows that among the incarcerated are not only innocents like him, but soldiers of the Republican Guard, brutish and corrupt, as well as criminals and perverts who will rape little boys. Um, and this is a situation that Zaki, who used to love to play Beatles songs on the guitar, is, is now in. And then she talks about her father. She says, his legs have never recovered from being smashed again and again by Saddam's prison guards. He walks bent over and limping now as if he is stepping barefoot on glass. How can his mind and heart, already broken by torture and starvation, bear this strain? Uh, and she talks about how she tries to pray. She does her morning prayers. And then she says, then I go, uh, she goes to the mirror, quote, pick up my blue hijab, a garment to which I'm still unaccustomed, and put it on by the light of a candle. Fold the front over my forehead, pull the sides over my ears to hide every strand of hair, wrap it firmly around my neck, and pin it at the back. I never wore a hijab before this war, just as I never had to wear long skirts, and have not yet learned to move my head without fear of it slipping off. I spend all day holding my neck high and stiff until the ache burns down my back. And then she talks about how her face looks unfamiliar to her uh, in the mirror. Um, as you might be familiar with, if, you've, if you have been exposed to Islamic feminism, um, there are some women who wear the hijab by choice. Um, they see it as a sign of their faith, and they're proud to do that. Some people are not given the choice. And here, clearly, the issue is choice or not, forced or not. If you're doing something and you're proud of it, that's very different than if you are pushed to do so, and particularly if you're pushed to do so and don't feel like you recognize yourself. Uh, and this is something that really happens after the war. Naima does not wear this beforehand. Uh, and so you can see how the war has shifted uh, her experience, even of her own identity and her own self. On pages 114 to 115, you have, uh, I think, one of the most um, bold, I guess, one of the boldest and, and uh, just most vivid descriptions of war and the effect of war. And this is clearly, you have an example here of the transnational feminist critique of militarism that we've been talking about, where she's talking about going to the prison and what she sees. She's talking about how they have to, quote, scramble out of the way of a military convoy barreling past and prepared to stop for no one. Already we know of children and old people mown down by those convoys because they could not move out of the way quickly enough. I have seen the bodies myself, run over so many times they lie flattened to the road, reduced to nothing but bloody patches of organs and bones. Um, further on, she talks about the cluster bombs, and she says, I cannot think of those cluster bombs without outrage. It is forbidden by international law to use them in urban areas, yet the Americans and British rain them down on us without compunction. Cluster bombs are filled with small, colorful tin balls, many of which do not explode on first impact. Instead they lie in the streets looking as harmless as toys, waiting for a passing vibration to detonate. Thus the child who picks one up with delight, or the young mother who walks by innocently pushing a pram, that's a stroller, are turned into suicidal murderers, setting off an explosion that shreds themselves and all around them to pieces. This is one of the reasons our hospitals are filled with babies without arms, and our graveyards with disembodied heads and limbs. What sort of a demon invents a weapon like this? And what sort of a population allows its armies to use it? But then what did we do when Saddam gassed the Kurds with his own demonic weapons? And what did we do when he slaughtered the Shia, my mother's people, stole their water, dried up their fields, and destroyed their livelihoods? We too can be sheep. This is extremely important because it's clear that Naima is not simply singling out American militarism here and saying, you know, the Americans are bad, they've brought these cluster bombs, this is what's happening. She's calling out militarism, generally, whether it's employed by someone like Saddam Hussein, gassing the Kurds, or whether she's talking about the United States and Britain. And you can see that the images of uh, utter carnage she's talking about are predominantly women and children. She's talking about women walking their babies in their strollers. She's talking about children who think that these cluster bombs are toys. So clearly here you have this articulation of how the people who suffer, the innocents who suffer in this, um, are, are women or the people who have to kind of take care of the carnage are women. Um, you have here a very strong indictment of militarism as something that 
that is not feminist, that is anti-feminist, that is uh, degrading to women. And this is not limited to a critique of, of U.S. militarism by any means, as you see in this chapter. This is a very important thread throughout this novel. I introduced it in an earlier lecture, uh, and this passage from 114 to 115 is particularly important in discussing this. So we have um, also, throughout the novel, there are many places where this happens, but one place where it happens is you have uh, some parallels being drawn between April and Zaki. This is particularly important because, remember, it is difficult for a lot of American soldiers to humanize Iraqi civilians. Uh, they're seen as potential enemies. We talked about a passage in a previous lecture where children who are begging for food, who are, who are starving, um, you know, the, con the people on the convoy, the Americans on the convoy want to feed them, give them food or water. They're told not to because one of the kids could be carrying a bomb. So, you know, the, the children are viewed very differently. Um, but Kate actually draws comparisons between April and Zaki, between her own sister and Naima's brother. And so you see the humanizing element that takes place there. On page 97, um, we have, we already discussed, the kind of April showers moment uh, where she's thinking about, you know, the soldiers and her job, and then she remembers April with a walkie-talkie. And so there's this, this sense of, you know, April just being a, an innocent child and that kind of coming into the context of uh, her job. On page 120, you have Naima's description of Zaki. Um, so from the top of the page, you have Zaki, Zaki being popular with his little gang of boys at school, etc. And then you have this description, this, this family story of Zaki where, um, you know, he, he loves to play around, he loves to uh, just kind of be goofy. Um, and you have kind of towards the first third of the page, uh, Zaki, who so loves to clown, would introduce the silliest twists. The hero would turn out to have chicken legs. So there's a soap opera on TV, and he's trying to reinvent the plot. Or the heroine to have two husbands and two heads, one for each. Ideas I'm sure he gleaned from Granny's stories. He would jump up and stalk about the room, jerking his head and picking up his thin little legs, with just the same comic del delicacy as chickens do. I find myself smiling at the memory as I walk from the prison back to the house. Um, she says, these times will come again, they must. But with the little Kate soldier removed from the checkpoint, how am I to find anything of Papa and Zaki? How am I to know whether the Americans are as brutal in their prison as Saddam was in his? Again, you have the transnational feminist critique of militarism, and you also have children who humanize uh, this, this experience of war. Um, there's a passage on 179 in which you have a return to what we talked about with the different versions of Christianity. Um, on 134 to 135, uh, you have the thing about throwing down the Bible. This is a very brief mention here where um, the soldier is in the um, hospital. And this is on 134. Um, her parents are there and saying, you know, I know it's hard. I know this is difficult. Uh, your time here is difficult. And her father especially, um, on 134, he opens his eyes again and gives his daughter the severest sheriff glance he can muster. The Lord helps those who help themselves. You've got to want to be better. You've got to try. Otherwise, nobody can help you at all. Not only are her hands shaking, now her whole body is. Just go, the shoulder shouts. Um, and she tells him to get away. Sheriff Daniel Brady rises to his feet. I know it's been hard. I know you've been through a lot, but you need to stop behaving like this. And she says, leave. And the soldier picks up her father's Bible and throws it as hard as she can at the vase, selling, sending yellow petals and shards of glass flying all over the room. Um, so here you have um, the Bible symbolizing her parents' uh, version of Christianity. Um, and her father isn't just referred to as her father. He's referred to as Sheriff Daniel Brady. So that you know symbolizes all of the power that he holds there, the patriarchal power, the power in society, the kind of aggressive... Um, you know, masculinity of, of being sheriff, etc. He symbolizes all of those things that she has tried to become by being a soldier and is basically victim blaming here, as we, as we talked about before. Um, and so you can see by throwing her father's Bible, she's throwing his version of morality, his version of, you know, everything that she's tried to emulate uh, down. And you see the, the, the yellow petals uh, falling everywhere and the shards of glass. On 179, you see uh, her discussion of her mom's Jesus. So again, you have a reference to her parents' version of Christianity um, and the, the cross in particular that's being discussed there. 
On 190 to 192, um, you have a discussion of Kate attacking Naima's father, only she doesn't realize it's Naima's father. Um, this is really difficult to read, but something that uh, I think probably some people might, might want to examine because it's one of the most important passages in the text. Um, Kate is being encouraged by other MPs or military police to come and basically beat up this man because Kate believes that this is the man who's been harassing her while she's been on the tower, you know, doing really kind of kind of horrible things to her to try to humiliate her. Um, and so she decides, you know, he, that she wants to beat him up. This is not the same person who's been doing those things to her, though, and this is part of that Orientalist thinking where all the Iraqis look the same to her. She's not distinguishing them. Um, so on 190, um, she says, I grabbed the jerk off shredded hands, cuffed them behind his back, and pulled the cuffs tight, just like I was taught in MP training. Then I kicked the back of his knees so he falls, put my foot on the shoulder on his shoulders, and shove his pervert face right into the sand. She tells him to eat dirt uh, and c curses at him. Quote, I want him to know that a girl is doing this to him. One of those females he thinks is no better than the shit he's been throwing at me. I want him to know how it feels to be treated like you're not even human. So I stamp my boot down on the back of his head and grind his face deep into the desert. It feels great. The MPs are laughing. You go, girl, says a big surgeon with the name Flackman on his uniform. Anything else? Uh, he says, you know, he's all yours. Yeah, I say one more thing. And I bend over and pick up the jerk-off's head by his blood-matted hair so I can look right into his evil eyes and show him who I am. This is really significant because the eyes represent the soul. Um, they're going to be face to face. The face, of course, has the identifying features. So this is this is a time for us to either for Kate to either see him as just another Iraqi, an Iraqi man who she stereotypes as you know treating her poorly because she's a girl, thinking that he treats all women badly, etc., because it's part of his culture, all those kinds of stereotypes. She has the opportunity to see him that way or to see him for the individual that he is. Um, she says, this, this is really hard to read, she says, I stare at him a moment, seeing his face close up for the first time, his eyes streaming tears, his nose and mouth filled with snot and blood and sand. He's struggling for breath, choking, his chest heaving. I drop his head and back away. Oh, God. Something wrong, Flackman asks. The prisoner's still on his stomach, gasping, his face pressed into the sand, ragged hands leaking blood all over his back. What's his name, I say, my voice wobbling. He says, you know, how should I know? Ask him. I need to know. Don't hurt him. And then Flackman looks at her like she's crazy, um, then says, hey, you, the lady wants to know your name. The man is not in a position to speak because of how he's been treated. Forcing myself to move at last, I push Flackman aside and crouch next to the prisoner's head. It isn't the jerk off at all. I know that now. Is your name Halim Al Jabor? I ask shakily. But I know the answer. I know it just as well as I know his name and face from Naima's photograph. Very slightly, he nods. Frantically, I start clearing the sand from Mr. Al Jabor's mouth, his eyes, his bloody cheeks with my bare fingers. I think I'm saying something to him, too, something about Naima, but I don't know. I brush off his blood caked hair, his shoulders, and lay his head gently back down on the sand, sideways so he can breathe. Then I try to undo the handcuffs around his flayed wrists. He lies there, eyes closed, his cheek pressed to the ground, breath shuddering, his face is gray. And Flackman, you know, is, is saying, What are you doing? He is in, in, imagining that Kate has lost it somehow because she's no longer treating this Iraqi and he just sees him as like any other Iraqi violently as the enemy. Kate is treating him like an individual and saying he's innocent, we have to get him a medic, and they just pull her away. Um, they call her Mary Poppins um, and have her dragged away and even though she keeps saying, you know, this is somebody who I know, this is actually somebody um, who shouldn't be here. So we know from other parts of the novel that um, this is Naima's father, and the reason why he went and ran into a fence is because he learned um, about what happened to Zaki, right? And and so um, after learning that, he he can't bear it. He can't bear the fact that he's lost his son. Uh, he feels like he has no reason to live anymore. He runs into this fence, and that's why he was behaving erratically. Um, but then through a case of mistaken identity, um, people think that, oh, this is the man that Kate wants to get back at. Um, so... This really humanizes uh, the Iraqi man, uh, really um, forces Kate and thus the reader to confront what she is doing. 
um, and the way in which she has dehumanized the prisoners. And the novel does not make this easy for us because just like Kate detests the man who harasses her while she's in the tower, we don't like him either, right? I mean, we, we have this, we have to have a complex sense of Iraqi people that some of them are not very nice people. Some of them should be punished. Some of them are, you know, behave in this way. And some of them are like Naima's father, just like in any society, right? There's this diverse range. It's not all Iraqi men are bad and oppressed women, or all Iraqi men are not bad and don't oppress women. The novel forces us to see this as an actual society, just like any other society, and then forces us to see what happens when um, the, the military, in this case, does not act that way. Um, so this is a profoundly heartbreaking se uh, section. On page 193, you have Naima reading her father's love letters to her mother while he was imprisoned by Saddam Hussein. He wrote poems in his mind and then actually transcribed them later. Um, and that also humanizes Naima's father. That could be read in conjunction with the attack on Naima's father. Um, you also have Kate and Jimmy's kiss and the fact that when they kiss on the watchtower, she's beginning to have that PTSD, whereas his face comes close to hers. She imagines Naima's father's face on page 204. And so you start to see the effect on Kate because she has been acting in this way um, as though Iraqis should be dehumanized, etc. Her job is actually requiring her to act this way. Her fellow soldiers are requiring her to act this way. The culture of militarism is forcing her to interact this way. Um, but she realizes that this is not, this is not the way to be. Uh, and that starts intruding into her more intimate moments uh, with, with Jimmy. You also have on page 213 a passage where Kate is shooting out windows at home with her father's gun and there's a description of all the faces that she sees. This is Kate suffering profoundly from PTSD. She is extremely ill here. She goes into her house, takes her father's gun from where it's kept uh, on page uh, 213. Uh, took her dad's gun from its sacred place. This is uh, a quote here in the sideboard and shot out the dining room windows because those faces were staring in. Cormac's face, the jerk-off's face, Mr. Algebor's face. How April huddled in the corner screaming because she didn't understand that her sister was only trying to protect her. How the dad threw the soldier into the car to take her here. This is a moment in which Kate takes her father's gun, in other words, tries to appropriate the phallus or the symbol of masculine control and power uh, from its sacred place. And instead of preserving the home or, you know, becoming the patriarchal figure, she's actually destroying the home. So the same home that, you know, valued all of these things, this kind of patriarchal masculinity and improving masculinity and strength through aggressive militarism, Kate realizes she must destroy. And the impetus for that is Cormac's face, the person who sexually assaulted her. Um, she sees the jerk-off's face, so the Iraqi man who also, you know, masturbates in front of her and all those kinds of things that are, that are harassment. Uh, and then you have um, Naima's father's face, and so the realization of, of what she has actually done. Um, at the very end of the novel, you have Naima and her mother's drive with her grandmother. Um, and so you also have a section where you have more on the transnational critique, uh, transnational feminist critique of militarism, because you see these women, both of them who represent, you know, this very long uh, uh, human story about, about what Iraqis are going through. And you have all the things that they're observing along the way. Um, she talks about how the soldiers look inhuman in their, in their uniforms. Uh, she talks about all the children by the side of the road. She talks about how they're mal malnourished, hungry, begging. Some, quote, some even right, run right up to the American truck, so close I fear for their lives. Are these the people the Americans have come to help? If so, how does it help to drop bombs on their houses and imprison their sons and fathers? To destroy their villages already so poor and slaughter their babies? To murder, murder them and not even know their names? Uh, that is kind of a, a little bit of a parallel to, to Kate. Um, hurting Mr. Al Jabour without realizing his name. Is this the way to liberate a people from a dictator, or has the world gone mad for the taste of oil and blood? Um, so here you definitely have this, this critique of militarism, and it continues on to page 219 um, when you have the blood-smeared uh, infant, uh, etc. So another passage you can look, look at if you're tracing that. So I hope that my discussion of some passages from San Queen, and in particular their connection to other uh, terms, to the historical context, to some of the um, issues that we've been talking about in terms of gender and Orientalism, 
or the Transnational Feminist Critique of Militarism. I hope this was helpful for you. Uh, we're not we're not doing you know a lot of discussion boards about this uh, novel uh, in part because the paper is so short, uh, and in part because we had to give more time to the eight to ten page paper on passing. Um, but I hope that this is helpful for you as you're preparing for that discussion board activity where you've done your, you'll be doing your threads chart, uh, the one that's due uh, on October 8th. So I'd like you to, uh, at this point, um, keep thinking about this issue of what threads you're going to follow and what passages you want to analyze, what theme you're most interested in, what course terms might be relevant. And as you're thinking through that, if you have questions or want to discuss this more, please feel free to contact me. You can come in during my office hours, make an appointment with me, send me an email. Um, and I want to reassure you that I've had many, many appointments with people from our class. It is never, um, you know, an unwelcome intrusion. It's something that I enjoy and want to do. I apologize that our experience in this class has been so... Um, stressful in terms of the timeline. The seven-week format forces us to just really do things very quickly um, without necessarily following up in the way that I otherwise would want to. Um, I thank you for your patience and please feel free to contact me if you want to discuss the text further. Thank you.